are trees able to form friendships? Can forests have moods? Do trees warn each other of danger? You may think these are ridiculous questions to ask, but forester Peter Vorleben presents a compelling scientific case for these and other surprising discoveries. It's all in his new book, The Hidden Life of Trees, What They Feel, How They Communicate. And Peter Vorleben joins us now. It's great to have you here. Nice yeah. to meet you. Thank you, Steve. First, let's start. What are you wearing? Yeah, that's a Forrester uniform from Germany. That's not a strange fashion, fashion taste of me. <laughs> I, I have also uh, clothes which, which are not green, but uh, yeah, that's the, the common uh, Forrester uniform from Germany. And forced? Yeah, forced mean, yeah, means forced. There it forced, is, right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, and right. this is your coat of arms as well. Yeah, that's the, the um, sign from the little village where, I'm, uh, where I have a job, uh, where I'm uh, working as a Forrester. Understood. Okay, let's get into your book now. Peter, trees can talk. Yeah, really. Not like we um, do talk, but uh, they can talk by scent, for example. And they, for example, when a tree is stitched by an insect, it feels pain. Yeah, you can measure electrical signals going through the tissue. And there's a reaction uh, going on, but not just in this tree, but also the surrounding neighbors are reacting. And scientists are, have uh, long questioned why. And uh, nowadays, they know that the trees are communicating by, f by scent, for example. Uh, they, there's a special scent which means, oh, there's a bug attacking, prepare you. But there are also other scents. For example, when an elm tree is eaten by um, a caterpillar, then this elm tree may taste the saliva and say, ah, that's this species of uh, caterpillar, and may call their predators. That are little wasps which uh, lays their eggs in these caterpillars and eat them up by the inner sides. That's not so nice, but the tree <laughs> gets rid of the aggressors. What made you even think to consider studying this issue? Um, yeah, in the first, yeah, let's say years, um, I was uh, yeah, a normal forester and I know about uh, tree feelings as much as the butcher about. Uh, animal feelings, mm -hmm. and uh, that's also, uh, knowing t too much about it, it's uh, bad for the business. But um, in, in my forest district, we created a burial forest, a forest where people may be buried in urns. And there, uh, I, I did it to rescue this old forest. It's a 4,000-year-old uh, 4, beech tree forest, and the people can buy their trees uh, as a living headstone. Hmm. And uh, yeah, and then together with those people, my view became uh, a better one, not just as a forester, but uh, I saw trees once uh, again as wonderful beings and not just as raw materials for the, for the next uh, sawmill. And uh, together with those people, I discovered uh, new things in the forest. And then I discovered that, for example, that a very old, uh, yeah, at first it looks to me like a stone, a moss-covered stone, and it turns out to be the remnant of an old tree stump. The tree uh, has been felled f uh, four or five hundred years ago, and this old stump is still living. And the question is, how can that be? It, it burns sugar in its cells, like we do, without any green leaf. So where um, came, came the nutrition uh, from, from where? And the only explanation is that the surrounding neighbor trees supporting this old fellow to keep it alive. Do the trees, when they communicate, make any sound at all? <laughs> they make sounds, but we don't know what it has to mean. Because, for example, when they are thirsty, thirsty, then they, yeah, they, let's say, scream. Yeah, in, in an um, ultrasonic uh, mode. We don't know if there's any tree listening to it, but we know there's research being done that plants can um, do noises with their roots. And then the roots of the other trees or grass or whatsoever are moving towards this sound source. So there's a, a response, and we, but we, we don't know very much about this um, type of communication. You say the scream is ultrasonic. Yeah. Does, can, can we hear what no, that no. sounds like? We cannot. We cannot hear, but I think in, in Germany, I don't know where it is, in Berlin or so, there's a university who uh, put electronic devices mm -hmm. on trees so that, that you can hear the trees screaming uh, on the internet. You can hear the tree yeah. screaming on the internet. Well, just okay. when it's dry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want to read an excerpt from your book here. Yeah. So here we go. A pair of true friends is careful right from the outset not to grow over overly thick branches in each other's direction. The trees don't want to take anything away from each other. And so they develop sturdy branches only at the outer edges of their crowns. That is to say, only in the direction of non-friends. Such partners are often so tightly connected at the roots 
that sometimes they even die together. How do you think trees develop these, as you call them, friendships? Um, trees are able to um, detect um, which sort of tree is standing beside. For example, a mother tree is able to detect um, its own child, its own seedlings. Um, in the root tips, there are brain-like structures. The University of Bonn is doing research on this. That sounds esoteric, like Lord of the Rings, like <laughs> the ends or so, but that's reality, that's a fact. They have brain-like structures and there are brain-like processes going on. And with those root tips, they are able to see, ah, that's my, uh, my uh, relative, a family member, that are my uh, children, or that is a tree which may become a friend. That happens uh, not very often, perhaps uh, in one of 50 cases, because you're not able to move as a tree, and when, when the tree uh, next to you is not nice to you, then it won't be a friend, and yeah, for the rest of your lifetime, you are a lonely tree. But sometimes it's matches, and then those trees combine their root system and yeah, work together as uh, being a, whole, uh, a single tree. When you are walking through a forest, can you just tell with the naked eye, these two are friends, yeah. these two are friends? Yeah. You can tell? Yeah, and hopefully the readers are afterwards also able to do. Because uh, it's really easy to detect it. Um, you just have to uh, watch above you in the crowns, and then you see trees which are working together, bring the branches just in the outside. And trees which are no uh, friends, they do it like this. No? They, they shrink their, their uh, thick branches, they struggle a little bit for light, and uh, real friends don't do that. They don't disturb each other, yeah, and you can see that uh, on your own, and perhaps all readers. Are some trees more social than other trees? Really, yeah, you can, you can see that um, uh, the best when you're uh, watching old stumps. Uh, they are not, um, not all old stumps are supported in the way I described it. Um, there are some stumps which rot away very fast and go, um, go, to, go back to earth like uh, humus. And those stumps, yeah, you can say they are lone wolves, which uh, like, like we have it in the human society, there are always people who want to have to do nothing with other people and uh, you, these things you can also find among trees. But can you tell, for example, that a maple tree is more friendly than a cedar tree or a pine tree than a birch tree? Yeah, kind of yeah. yeah, you can say that. That depends on the species. For, uh, for example, a birch tree uh, likes to live on its own. And when there's a neighboring tree stands beside it, the birch tree um, has hanging branches which are working like wipes. And when the wind is going through, uh, it wipes the, the branches from the neighbor tree away. We have such a, um, uh, a pair of the Douglas fir and a birch um, in my garden. And the birch wiped out the branches uh, from the Douglas fir in the shape of the birch crown. Hmm. So uh, yeah, the birch is a little aggressive. Is that because it's a hardwood or that has nothing to do with no, it? No, it has nothing to do with it. Um, birch trees are used to live on their own because um, they are the first ones to settle on new land. And there, on new land there is no forest and you have, to, you have to compete, you have to be fast. And so because they, they are exhausted uh, within 100 years, after 100 years, and that's a short period, a short time for a tree, mm -hmm. then they will die. And so they are not so social like uh, Douglas fir or, or beech trees or... Uh, maple or whatsoever. Do you have any hesitation putting human-like qualities, like friendship, yeah. um, on trees? No, um, because um, the book, I have to explain it, the book um, is, I don't like to write, and, and honestly, um, I like to guide people through my forest. And I, I'm doing that uh, since 25 years. And then the first time, I think I explained it too technical with technical terms and too scientific. The people were bored. And then I, I tried to, to get them, to catch them, and to explain it in a, in a more smooth way. And yeah, then I recognized that scientific speech is without emotions. And we are working um, at least about 90% on emotions. And telling people things without emotions is a non-human speech. So I, when, we, when you put emotions back to it, everyone can understand it. For example, when I say a mother tree suckle its children, then everyone knows exactly what's going on. No one thinks that a tree will, will put it to its breast, right. but uh, everyone is, no, uh, is, no, uh, is knowing what's going on. And that's the way the book is. The book is uh, at last a uh, um, written guided tour through my forest. Since trees are alive, obviously, and since, as you've told us, through ultrasonic waves, they scream in a certain way, do you know whether they feel pain when they get chopped down? Yeah, 
really. I think um, they feel pain. When we uh, chop a tree, then we think uh, the tree is dead. But what is the tree? Is, for example, is a trunk? Perhaps it's nothing, uh, nothing um, else than uh, a big, uh, yeah, a big trunk, a big, big uh, metal thing with solar cells on it. And the real tree is in the soil. Hmm. We don't know it. We don't, for example, we don't know where a tree stores its memories. And when I told you um, that a tree has in its root tips brain-like structures, perhaps that's the main thing on trees. And when you when you chop down a tree. You just chop down its solar cells, and the and the um, bigger part of the tree, the most important part of the tree, is still there, and that's perhaps the reason why it is supported by the neighbor trees. Hmm. I know what the World Wide Web is. What is the Wood Wide Web? <laughs> <laughs> the Wood Wide Web is the combination of root and fungi network in the forest. The fungi network, um, the fungi uh, are not able to feed themselves like plants. So um, scientists don't know where, whether they are animals or plants. And so they say the whole world uh, is on animals, plants and uh, fungi. So the fungi uh, are growing in the soil. In one teaspoon uh, full of earth, you have uh, several miles of fungi filaments. And um, the fungi um, are connecting the trees and transporting, for example, news. News from one tree to another. And therefore, they, are, they get sugar solution, uh, they are getting paid for it, and they are very expensive. Uh, because a tree has to pay as much as one third of the whole photosynthesis production. Mm. That's as much as a tree stores in, in form of timber. So it's a very expensive wood wide web, but it works. How far can those messages go? We don't know. We don't know. Um, um, fungi can become very big, uh, several square miles in size, and um, the research is um, still on its way. Um, how far it goes, what news are transported, and that not, uh, are not just news and also sugar solution, because the trees are not just supporting themselves uh, via a root network, but also on this fungi network. And the fungi is not always working proper. It's, uh, uh, it has its own strategy. For example, when it should uh, transport sugar from one beech tree to another, sometimes it's um, getting some sugar to other tree species because perhaps one time, one day, the beech trees will die. And um, then the fungi will die too because uh, it, it relies on trees. And um, yeah, when there's another species living in this forest, the fungi uh, may uh, survive and therefore they're supporting, although they are no, not supposed to do so, other species. Hmm. There's a story in your book about when a giraffe starts to eat from an acacia tree. Yeah. Tell us the story. What happened? Um, when a giraffe eats uh, on, on a leaf on an acacia tree, then this acacia tree feels pain. It hurts. And um, a acacia tree can taste the saliva and say, ah, a giraffe. And uh, then happens something uh, which I think is really a social uh, behavior. Um, uh, while it's pumping poisonous substances in its leaves, and that goes very slow because uh, trees are really slow beings, mm. uh, it's warning in the meantime the surrounding acacia trees by scent. And um, there's a problem with the scent on windy days. Yeah, there's just some uh, acacia trees which are um, getting warned, and the other ones which are standing against the wind um, know nothing. And the, the giraffes knows that, and they are moving forward against the wind to uh, hmm. keep on feeding. <laughs> to keep ahead of the knowledge that the trees right, would right. spread. Yeah. Amazing. Why do you think it's important for us to know what trees are saying? Um, that's important for two things. Because um, when we, uh, on, on one hand, um, it's better to uh, know that because we can manage forests in a better way. Healthy forests produce more and better timber and uh, produce more oxygen and are more stable in storms and fire and so on. But on the other hand, it's more fun for us. We, we may enjoy it. For example, mm -hmm. when you look in a, at, at an elephant, you don't ask what, what benefits uh, give it to us. We just say, oh, what a wonderful being. Mm -hmm. And when you look on a plant elephant, and trees are plant elephants, the biggest plants that we have, and uh, you know all those wonderful things, you have, I think you will have a lot of fun when you walk through the forest. A lot of fun, but do you want us to change the way we deal with trees? Yeah, that, that would be a, a great thing. Um, uh, I don't want, want to say, uh, make it in, on this rule, on this, and this. And uh, I, I think when people begin to 
love trees and look at them like on elephants. Then they uh, won't waste paper for things which are not worthful. They perhaps will reduce a little consumption. And when they buy um, things based on timber, then perhaps from better managed forests. Everything we've been talking about so far deals with the big forests that you work in. Yeah. But what about a tree that's planted in the concrete in the middle of a city? Or a tree in a park in the middle of a city? Yeah, is yeah. their life different? Their life is very different. But uh, they are like street kids. They, they start their life uh, without mother. You know, uh, normally, uh, usually a mother tree brings shade to the little ones and uh, bring them to grow very slow. In the street, um, yeah, there's no mother. The trees can grow as they like to grow, but uh, they are disabled. Because when you want to plant a tree, uh, you cut the roots to, to get it better planted. Because, for example, when you have a tree uh, in about five meters in size, you have to have a root system of 10 meters in diameter. You are not able to plant that. So the gardeners cut the roots and they cut the brain like root tips. And everyone knows what's, what's happened to human beings when they are getting cut brain-like things. And the trees won't recover for the rest of their life from this treatment. So they are going very flat with their roots through the crown. And that's the reason why, for example, when we have a storm in the city, those trees are thrown down to the ground uh, very easily. Hmm. Let's do one more quote before we leave today. It is okay to use wood as long as the trees are allowed to live in a way that is appropriate to their species. And that means that they should be allowed to fulfill their social needs, to grow in a true forest environment on undisturbed ground, and to pass their knowledge on to the next generation. And at least some of them should be allowed to grow old with dignity and finally die a natural death. It does make me wonder whether you're at all guilty for the trees that had to die to make this book. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, and that's, yeah I'm, I'm also heating with firewood. Um, I'm a human being. I'm not able to make photosynthesis. And for example, uh, example, when you eat breakfast, you need farmland, and there once stood a primeval forest. So the question is, what are our rights? What are the rights of the trees? And I think we have to, uh, to get it in a better balance. And then it's OK to use wood. Wood is a, a really great stuff and to, to make a table out of timber or to, to heat with wood. But I think we should leave some land, some uh, preserves for trees so that they are able to live in family bands and so that we have fun to watch them how they live. Ausgezeichnet. <laughs> Thank right. you, Peter. That was fabulous. Peter Volleben, The Hidden Life of Trees. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit tvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.